Good afternoon. Welcome in to Locked On Sports Atlanta for another edition of our Locked On Sports Atlanta Hangout. I'm Mark Zeno. I'm joined by John Chuckery of Hitting Hard, Jarvis Davis of ATL Day Ones. As once again, uh, like Voltron, we come together to bring you the ultimate sports show uh, surrounded by Atlanta sports. Gentlemen, uh, good day to you. How is everybody doing? Doing really well, Mark. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate that, man. <laughs> nobody complains on Friday, right? Like nobody, nobody complains on Friday. Friday. <laughs> and we got paid, so nobody complains on Friday. First time listener, first time uh, hosting. Yeah, let's yeah. do it, man. Hey, hey, hey. Uh, listen, there, there's a lot to get to. It's great to be with everybody again. You know, we, this is the second iteration of our our, our Locked On ATL hangout. So uh, where we all come together, you guys have if you follow us here on Locked On at Locked On ATL um, and you know, see all the different shows. We, we try to come together once a month where we uh, just put all the brain trust together and, ha and have some great discussion about what's going on here in Atlanta sports. So iteration number two of this, we, we do give a, a moment of silent and pause for Sweet Tea, Tanitra Batiste, who's not with us today, also part of our Locked On Sports Atlanta network. Uh, but she'll be back for our next iteration. We promise that. All right, let's get into it here, gentlemen, as we start Atlanta Falcons uh, heading into their third preseason game. Uh, and, and I guess, I mean, I think the Deion Jones thing itself is, is a whole different conversation that we'll get into later but you know i am somebody and i've said this routinely on a to z like i don't look for anything in preseason games like i don't care i don't think there's anything to glean from this stuff i, I don't i i don't have much uh i don't think there's much translation for what i see in a preceding game to the regular season but there has only been kind of one thing that i've really been monitoring and watching that i saw from the first preseason game to the second preseason game and at least in the second preseason game, I saw quarterbacks who stayed in the pocket and didn't run. Because at the end of the day, you know, the best playmaker on this offense is Kyle Pitts. The second best playmaker may be Drake London. The third best playmaker might be Cordero Patterson. You know who I know the best playmaker isn't? Marcus Mariota or Desmond Ritter. So it's their job to get the ball in the hands of their best playmaker, and I want to see more of that than anything else. Taking off and running for six yards on third and five, that's great. It's wonderful. But it's not a recipe for winning four quarters of a football game. You've got to get the ball to other people who can make things happen. And for me, that's the only thing I really care about from an offensive standpoint. Well, also, too, is you got to be able to block for those guys, too, right? I mean, that's the other right. thing. Like, when, yeah. when I, when, the, the, the thing that I've really <laughs> watched is tell me what our offensive line is going to look like, right? I mean, you know, we're still, there's one position left that's center. And I was here and Jarvis was here when it was James Stone and Mike Person. And literally they couldn't, when Matt was in shotgun, they literally couldn't snap the football to him. He had to have a baseball glove and scoop it off the turf. You don't want to be bad, you know, at certain positions on your offensive line. So the center battle to me, which Arthur Smith's made it clear, we're not going to know what's going to happen with that spot until we get into game week but I want to see somebody take the lead in that. I want to see somebody go win it right now. Nobody's going out there and winning it. It's attrition right now. That's happening at, at center. Yeah. Uh, uh, McGarry's won the right tackle spot. He's legitimately won that, you know, Wilkinson, I think by default is guard, but nobody's hit, tried to win the center job. I want to see somebody go out there and run somebody over at that spot and, and tell me that they want to win the job. So I'm with you, Mark. I mean, I don't want my quarterbacks running all around, Part of that running around was because they're going to get their head caved in if they don't run around and get something done. And I think that's one of the reasons why Arthur Smith offense kind of fits what he wants. These guys want to fit what he wants to do as far as Desmond Ritter and Marcus Mariota, because let's face it, like Arthur Smith has had success with pretty mediocre quarterbacks in this league, right? Because I think that he's an excellent play caller. I think he's puts his quarterbacks in situations where you're, they're going to be able to have easy, have easy decisions to make. If it's not there, one to two reads, and then then you take off with the football because that's going to help your offense. Going to help move the chains, keep your defense off the field. I think all of those things are part of Arthur Smith's plan for this offense to be better. So, but I, so, but I do think there is something that you can glean from preseason, right? Because I think that I think I've seen you know Matt, Matt Hennessy kind of take the reins with that with that position because. We don't necessarily have been really calling his name, right? We like we we saw last year there were a lot of leaks up in the middle. Like we saw Matt Hennessy, damn Matt Hennessy, damn Matt Hennessy, holding penalty, you know, hold a dude if you're gonna get beat like that. I just we think we saw a lot of things last year, and I don't think we necessarily seeing that. But I think Drew Dahmer did have a solid game this past this past past week, but there still was some things that I think he needs to get better on. So I'd rather get a guy in there that. You don't necessarily call his name for anything bad. And if, if that's the case with the offensive lineman, that's all you really ask for. 
I mean, Mark, you know, let, let me say one thing, Mark, right. to you. You know, but besides having uh, Derrick Henry and Ryan Tanner, you know what else Arthur Smith had? He had Jack Conklin and Taylor Lewan and guys like that to just run people over. So, you know, it's, it's yeah. easy to have a great running game when those guys are leading the way up front, too. Yeah, and to your point, like, I, I have resigned to the fact from the offensive line, this is on Arthur Smith. He's got to scheme his way out of this. That, yeah. That's all you can do. That's, that's fair. That's yeah. All he can do. Like, it, it, you know what you're working with. Every offensive coordinator, every play caller in the last three seasons in Atlanta – has understood that this is a major deficiency from a talent standpoint. Save left tackle. Uh, you've got questions, and maybe McGarry's getting a little bit better, but you've got questions across the board on the offensive line. So from that standpoint, it's on the coach and the coaching staff to be able to figure out a way to get positive yardage uh, and and not get yourself in third and seven every time because you're getting stuffed in the run. I, I don't know what that answer is. It may be very tough. It may, it may be a situation that they are going to struggle with. But at the end of the day, there is so much more, I think, in general on Arthur Smith this year than it is on the talent. And this is, the, guys, I can guarantee you this will be the post-mortem conversation we'll have on the 2022 season. You know, there'll be somebody like me saying, I got to blame Arthur Smith. He knew what he, he, knew what he had talent-wise. He knew he, he couldn't scheme out of it, couldn't do, push the right buttons. And people will say, well, when he gets better talent, he'll be able to do that. Which came first, the chicken or the egg, right? Are you a good yeah. coach because you know how to scheme or are you a good coach because you have good players? And, and I think that'll be the postmortem conversation on this season. I have to trust that Arthur Smith, if he's as good as we think he is, and he's as talented as we think he is of a head coach, it goes beyond having Taylor Wan, Jack Conklin, Derrick Henry, Ryan Tannehill, right? Like, there's got to be some measure of it's got to go beyond that because I feel like he would have been exposed a little bit last year because he didn't have any of those guys last year. And for good, better, and different, they still managed to win 10 games. And I don't think it was all Matt Ryan. Like, I, I know the quarterback matters. But Matt didn't win seven games on his own. There were other things that went on in those games that helped him win. Well, they were – the big difference is look at what they were in one-score games. They were dreadful yeah. under Dan Quinn in one-score <laughs> games, and they Terrible. turned that around in a year. So I'm with you, Mark. Look, There'll be some regression learn, here this year, though. Right. We're, we're going to learn more about Arthur Smith and Dean Pease and what those guys can do because they don't have all the talent. They don't have all the players that they want out there. They are going to have to coach better. And look, Arthur's trying to learn too. Look, he's going to have to be better. Timeouts, clock management, all the stuff that Dan never got better at as the, as the years went on. They were just as bad in year six as they were in year one and all that. So he's going to have to figure out some things as well. But I'm with you. They Part of why they won seven games last year is they did coach better, you know, and they were, you know, look, Say what you will under Dan. They were awful teams in the second half of games. If you look at their third quarter scoring and where they ranked in the NFL and how many points they gave up, they would come out of halftime and they would get run over by a lot of teams. They changed that and they changed up their, you know, dynamic in one score games. So I'm with you. They're going to have to coach a lot better this year if they are going to be competitive. I don't know if they can even get the seven wins or not, but if they get the six or seven wins, Hell, Arthur Smith might be the coach of the year in the NFL if they. I, I said the same thing. Look, if they, yeah. if they, with this roster, which generally everybody agrees, even though I don't, it's one of the worst in the NFL. Like it, there was a position grouping thing done by, uh, by ESPN.com. Every Falcons position group, with the exception of corner, tight end, and D line, which obviously is AJ Terrell, Kyle Pitts, and Grady Jarrett, was in the bottom five, if not dead last. So. Yeah. If, if Arthur Smith can get this to a six or seven win team with Marcus Mariota at quarterback, that is the coach of the year job, if you ask me. I, I, I wholeheartedly agree because, the, and the thing that, you know, I think um, Chuck made an uh, interesting point because the diff, the biggest difference between this coaching staff um, from and from Dan Quinn's staff is that these guys are going to make adjustments by hook or by crook, whether they were wrong or right in coming into a preparation for something. And and I think the prime example of that is when the uh, Arthur Smith decided to play the starters this year because he he decided not to do that last year. And he's saying, you know what, that was a mistake. I understand what it is. Now, you know, whether or not that would have helped us beat the, the, the Philadelphia Eagles in the opener, I don't know, but I know that I need to have my guys out there to kind of see what you yeah, have a good idea of what you're going to go into, right? Joint practices are also that. I mean, people want yeah. to do – the joint practices yep. are where the ones get all their reps so I can play the twos and the threes in an actual game and get more game tape on them, per se, because right. if I have to play the starters, that's less looks I have at the guys who might be 45 through 53 on the final roster. So the, the ones get all the reps in these practices, which is why they do them. Uh, and get less reps in the game so you can see the 
the other guys longer. So I, I think he's taking a different angle preparation wise. Let's see if it pays dividends week one against the Saints. You know, I mean, I, I, I don't know that necessarily it will. However, comma, uh, I am taking the Falcons with the points in week one, uh, mm. which is a uh, there's a trend there, guys. There is a trend. You okay. know, you can find, All you right. can find trends. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> you can find trends on this stuff at betonline.net. It's the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your betting needs. Find your favorite sports and events at the number one online source for odds, lines, and games. They have reviews and news on every league. Obviously, Major League Baseball winding down. They're going to start heading to the playoffs, get some great info there. NFL winding up as we are talking about. NBA right around the corner. NHL, combat sports, esports, and even golf. BetOnline continues to be the top online online resource for all your sports wagering information. Live in-game betting, scores, and podcasts, they've got you covered. Live in-game betting is a lot of fun. You don't have to be an expert at it. Um, there is really, really no secret formula. You just kind of watch the flow of the game and try to be predictive about what's going to happen. So you can head on BetOnline today. Use your mobile device. You can learn more about the action happening today. BetOnline, where the game starts. Uh, and wrapping things up here, guys, on the Falcons, just – It'll be interesting to see how this team starts. They have a very, very tough schedule. No one's going to be surprised if they struggle from a win and loss standpoint. But I'm not measuring win and losses for this team. I'm just measuring competitiveness. Are they competitive in games? Can they keep them close? I think that's really the only thing that matters. Yeah, going out on the West Coast early on when you got back-to-back West Coast games, that's not good for any team in the NFL to, to have to go out to L.A. and Seattle early on. But I'm with you. I mean, look, I, I, I've got to see – I've got to see that there is some kind of style and philosophy to what they do. And are we going to be better? So look, if, if they're another 18 sack team, this thing will be, you know, they'll be, they'll be drafting in the top one or two or three next year. If their quarterback play just falls off a cliff, they'll be drafting in the top one or two or three. And I think that that's the one, the thing that you have to kind of keep in mind is like the, that the progression of the defense, right? Because I, like you said, they're not sacking the quarterback. They're not doing anything. They're not getting better. And, and then that's, from a, then you got to start questioning the personnel evaluation because if you're not if you continue to bring in guys and using second and third round draft picks on guys that can't do what you drafted them to do, that's when you start to have another conversation. And yeah, I don't think I mean, we want to have that this early. The bottom, <laughs> bottom line is, is there are two categories that statistically change things offensively uh, for teams. The the touchdown rate when you don't give up a sack versus when you do give up a sack is a phenomenal difference. And when you do have a penalty versus when you don't have a penalty. Um, and the analytics nerds really dive into this, what happens when you have a penalty on or a sack on an offensive drive and what it does to impact it versus what happens when you're clean. So we'll see if they can control the things they can control in those areas. 